Hello and welcome to episode 122 of the How to Survive podcast. My name's Chris. I'm the good. Joining me as ever is Joe. And you can make up your minds which of the other two <laughs> categories he falls into. Because this week we are covering the 1966 Sergio Leone classic, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. If you haven't seen The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, it's available on DVD and digitally from Amazon and any other good uh, physical media stores uh, if they still exist where you are. We will be spoiling The Good, The Bad and The Ugly and uh, you've had 51 years to watch it. So uh, now's your chance to duck out if you've not seen it. You know, one of the things watching this, right? Mm. I'm Joe, by the way. Hi. Hi. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Just contextualising in case anyone thought you were speaking with a second voice. Yeah. Um, one of the things that struck me was Clint Eastwood, right? Mm. I was like, he must be 20 in this film. Like he's, he, it's the 67, he must be quite young. Yeah. Then he's got crow's feet. So I was mm. like, hmm. Yeah. The man's nearly 90 in real life. In real life. Yeah. Not in the no, good, the bad, no, no, no. <laughs> he's 37 in the good, the yeah. bad, and the ugly. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. But I, I think his crow's feet are more to do with spending like, most months of his and life. months yeah. of his life in Italian arid landscapes. Yeah, yeah, that wouldn't do any good for anyone. No. They're not smile lines, that's for sure. Yeah, that's true. Squinting, I think. Yeah. So if you haven't seen The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, go watch it because it is an all-time great, uh, a bona fide classic. But do mm. set aside a substantial portion of your day to watch it because yeah. it is three hours long. Yeah. Um, Where's it well? Yeah, it, does, it doesn't feel like a three-hour film in mm. the way that uh, it would if you went to see a modern film that was three hours long. Yeah, something like um, <laughs> Justice League. Or, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Something like Batman vs Superman. Or yeah, something like which that. is hide- hideously long. Never right. seen it, but I, neither, I, neither have I. But yeah. I don't want to set aside the time to do it. Right. You know? I, like you could also watch it over a few nights or something. But anyway, go watch the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful piece of work, and uh, you owe it to yourself to see it. This is your final warning for spoilers. Let's recap the film. The good. The bad. The ugly. Hitman, by the name of Angel Eyes, who a subtitle informs us is The Bad, interrogates a former soldier about a cache of Confederate gold stolen by a man named Bill Carson. The soldier, whom Angel Eyes is contracted to kill, offers him more money to kill the man who hired him instead, but Angel Eyes kills him and takes the money anyway. He then returns to his employer and kills him as well. He never fails to get his man. It's, that doesn't really work when the man is like dying of consumption on like a yeah. death <laughs> on a bed. sack of bed. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, Blondie, the good, and Tuco, the ugly, are playing a scheme on small town sheriffs. Blondie delivers Tuco, who is wanted for two thousand dollars, and collects the reward. Then returns and shoots the rope from which he will be hanged, freeing him. The two escape and reenact this scheme on another town until Blondie grows tired of Tuco and abandons him in the desert, penniless. A vengeful Tuco tracks him to a Confederate town and eventually captures him, force marching him across the desert. As Blondie is close to death from dehydration, a wagon of soldiers appears, including a dying Bill Carson. Mm. Carson promises to tell Tuco the location of $200,000 buried in the Sad Hill Cemetery, 
and offers the name of the grave in which it's buried in exchange for water. Tuco runs to get water for him, but when he returns, he discovers Carson is now dead and used his last breath to tell Blondie the name of the grave. Tuco rushes Blondie to a nearby mission in order for him to recover. Mm. Once Blondie is nursed back to health, the pair set off for the cemetery in stolen Confederate uniforms. By the way, this is all taking place during the American Civil War. Yeah, you missed the part as well where there's this weird reconciliation between Tuco and his brother. Well, it's not even a reconciliation, is it? um, Re-meeting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, who who works at the mission uh, as a priest. And um, it's uncomfortable, to say the least. But it gives some backstory to to Tuco. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Once Blondie is nursed back to health, the pair set off for the cemetery in stolen Confederate uniforms, but are quickly captured by Union soldiers. At the army's prison camp, they are met by Angel Eyes, who beats the location of the cemetery out of Tuco. Angel Eyes correctly deduces that the same treatment would not work for Blondie, and so they set off for Sad Hill together, promising to split the gold along with Angel Eyes' gang. Tuco escapes the prison camp and ends up in the same evacuated town as the group, Taking a bath in a hotel, he is surprised by a bounty hunter who he is able to kill. The gunshots alert Blondie, who finds Tuco, and the pair agree to reinstate their their partnership to find the gold. The pair kill Angel Eye's gang and depart. Tuco and Blondie arrive at Sad Hill to find it has become a battleground over a strategic bridge. The pair decide to destroy the bridge at the request of a disillusioned captain in order to disperse the armies. In case they die, Tuco suggests sharing their information and Blondie tells him the gold is buried in a grave named Arch Stanton. Once the bridge is destroyed, Tuco rides off to claim the gold for himself and begins manically searching the graveyard. Tuco finds Arch Stanton's grave and begins digging, Blondie arrives and encourages him to continue at gunpoint before Angel Eyes startles them both. Blondie reveals he lied about the name of the grave and suggests they have to earn the money. He writes the name of the grave on a rock and challenges the pair to a three-way duel. After a tense standoff, both Tuco and Blondie shoot at Angel Eyes, who tumbles into an empty grave dead. Tuco discovers his gun was unloaded by Blondie the night before. I suppose insuring himself against uh, Tuco turning on him. Exactly. Blondie reveals the gold is buried in a grave marked unknown next to Arch Stanton's and the pair uncover the cachet. As Tuco celebrates, he turns around to see a noose into which he is forced by Blondie. Blondie stands him on his share of the gold and leaves, seemingly condemning Tuco to death. Just as he clears the horizon, Blondie turns around and shoots the noose, releasing Tuco and leaving him with his share, alive but still tied up and cursing angrily. And that is the good, the bad and the ugly. Ending on a, um, you son of a... You son of a cut away. Uh, yeah. Just a day, you son of a cut! Later used... Uh, that's, a, that's a trope that was later used in um, Taxi with Queen Latifah, where she said, buckle, buckle up for safety, mother. Right. Cut away. Great <laughs> reference there. She didn't say fucker. They cut that part out. Hmm. So I mean, that was, you know, the first time we ever saw that. That trope used. <laughs> um, yeah. Not the only trope in this movie. Mm. What not did you think one. of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly? Had you seen it before? Yeah, years and years ago. I watched the whole um, Man With No Name uh, trilogy. Sort of, yeah, exactly. But they're yeah. not... They're not um, They're not strictly um, a coherent storyline, but they essentially are yeah. in the same way that James Bond films are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He plays an, an archetype, basically. Clint Eastwood plays an archetype, the man yeah. with no name. Yeah, exactly. Is it in this? It's Blondie. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, he's still the man with no name. Exactly, that's it's not a name. Not a real name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. not an eighties pop sensation. So <laughs> no, I yeah, I watched that years ago. It's it's a hell of a film. It's, yeah, it's epic in a way that people don't really say things are epic anymore. Yeah, um, you say epic now, you mean oh, Suicide Squad was epic. Yeah, you saw Harley Quinn's. And- Watch the new epic yeah. trailer for Justice League. Right. Yeah, now, but epic, I mean the sense of scale and the sense of 
this is a huge undertaking yeah. to make. They must have had like 500 extras. Mm. It's a huge film. More than that, surely. Like the, the war scenes are, are, yeah, are incredible. Yeah. yeah, And like there's no, you know, back in the 60s when they made it, there's no way to fake that. No, exactly. It's done like, in camera. The, yeah. um, it's Odyssey-esque, isn't it? In its construction. Yeah. The Homer's Odyssey is basically a person trying to reach one destination, but keeps getting waylaid at various by, points. Yeah, by little tasks. Yeah, yeah, and meeting sort of idiosyncratic characters and things along the way that is essentially what this film is yeah. it's like an odyssey-esque uh, western yeah. yeah and um i think it's an astounding achievement in epic cinema um and like you say it is the the like of which you know they don't make them like this anymore right exactly yeah um it has aged and it does feel long. Like, yeah. obviously, three hours of a film yeah. is not something that it's, we're used to watching anymore. There's, there's parts where it's like, they obviously just, like, just keeping the camera rolling. Yeah. Um, I mean, th- th- there are some strange tonal moments, I think. Mm. Um, and the dubbing of the dubbing all the is lines bizarre. Is, is bizarre. It's like a kung fu movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, and th- there is a, a dreadful or, like, non-existent treatment of women. Yeah. Because... There are only two women in the whole film. Yeah. One of which is uh, the mother who watches her son and husband get shot yeah. in the opening scene. And then um, a whore. Yeah, who Th- those appears are the to only- have been kidnapped and raped. Right. Yeah. Th- those are the only two um, women yeah. in the film. And the, the, the one who gets kidnapped and raped is then beaten. Beaten, yeah. yeah. It's, it's uh, unpleasant in that respect. Yeah, yeah. But um, with all that said... It is an astounding piece of work, I think. Yeah. Um, and I'm on record as saying this is the best film I've ever seen. Right. And I think that there's a, there's a distinction between it being my favourite and the best film, if you see what I mean. Right. Like, I think this is the most astounding achievement cinematically right. that I've ever seen. Like, every element of it, uh, especially when you consider the context, yeah, is yeah, yeah. so meticulously and perfectly crafted for what it is. Um, I don't think I've seen a, a better made film. And the, like, um, the movie that comes to mind, there's two movies that come to mind when I'm thinking about this. Right. I'm thinking about that that comparison of like, it's a perfect film and it's a huge execution in terms of scale. Yeah. One is The Revenant, which is recent. Right. Uh, which is like, that was done, it was a clearly a hugely physical undertaking to make it. And right. Shot in natural light. And it, like, it was, it's different in many ways. But even like the battle scene, yeah, they were kind of similar in those this sense of scale in those battle scenes. The other one is Interstellar, which is done in a, like a huge way. Yeah, uh, I don't think either of those films though quite live up to the same. Um, I think for me, The Revenant is always marred by how um, worthy mm. uh, it hasn't got a sense of humour. No, they they try and make uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's performance in particular like so central to the like the film mm. that if you don't completely buy into it, then the film starts to sort of fray at the edges right. and you're right in the sense that it is an incredible undertaking. And you know, the fact that they filmed it out in the wilderness and everything yeah, yeah, is, yeah. is incredible. But I think it is, um, I mean, people can go back and listen to our podcast about it. Yeah. I haven't exactly. watched it since. And no, exactly. And um, I will. No. Yeah. And, uh, Interstellar, I, I, yeah. um, similarly has problems. I think in the final act that, mar it it gets very confusing yeah i mean we don't have to go into that maybe no. we'll cover interstellar at some yeah, point maybe in the one day but my, my point is more like in terms of an undertaking like if, if you yeah. were to say there yeah. has been an undertaking here those mm. two films act as a comparison yeah i mean they're, they're different things aren't they because obviously the revenant is a physical undertaking and the interstellar is a sort of um technological mm. undertaking um which is astounding and that, like seeing that's, that that's how you i mean you you, you can't break the mold anymore with movies unless no. you do something like that that's true i mean james cameron tried to do it with avatar by saying this is you know 3d and it's all that sort yeah of thing. yeah but you that is technology is a way of breaking the boundaries right and you wouldn't it's very very unlikely i think that you'd get a movie now which had a cast of a thousand people yeah in a battle scene because they're just cgi it, exactly yeah 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 I like that's what I mean, really. I don't think this sort of film would get made anymore. No. Um, and in that respect, I suppose it's like a relic almost of a, a bygone era. Yeah, but it is an incredible film. Um, I want to talk a bit, little bit about Lee Van Cleef, okay? Um, who plays Angel Eyes? Yeah, because uh, he is 
the like atmosphere personified basically there, there's probably not as you know it's, it's one of the most perfect introductions to a villainous character right. that you can imagine yeah in that he walks in there's no dialogue for like the first five minutes of the film it's, it's more than that i count it it's yeah. like 15 minutes right yeah. he, he basically walks into a man's house and sits down uninvited starts eating but you can tell so much by the respect the other man gives him yeah like it's it's quite something to have a man walk into your house uninvited and sit down and start eating dinner. <laughs> yeah. But the the respect with which um, the other man treats him s- tells you so much. And Lee Van Cleef before this, the only time he'd worked with Sergio Leone, Sergio Leone before was as like a romantic lead. Right. And in this, it's it's basically the equivalent of like having, you know, I don't know, like a an equivalent. Like Chris Pratt playing a you right. know villain and doing it perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, his his you know the introduction to his character kills a man in like very cold blood. Right. Kills his child. Yeah. Leaves. Kills his employer and has like outlines in like that ten minutes. This very clear but obviously psychopathic like code that he follows. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, He's a fascinating character. He is. I think he's very clearly the bad, right? Right. And that's established yeah. from like you said. And now you get the ugly yeah. in Tuco's character. Right. Because A, he's relatively unattractive compared to Clint Eastwood and Lee Van Cleef. Yeah. I don't think that's what ugly necessarily is. No, he's means. also an like, ugly character, right? Yeah. yeah. He's like... He's, Spiritually ugly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. He's, he's a double crosser who is out for himself. Yeah. But he, does, he doesn't have that code like like the bad has. Right? No. But then I don't know what makes Blondie good other than the fact that he isn't bad, right? It's, it's like t- an t- absence t- of bad that <laughs> I makes t- him I good. I tell you what makes him good is yeah. he's Clint Eastwood. <laughs> like, exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, he, I, he I know what you mean. The, it, it basically, uh, Blondie and Tuco do much the same things for the whole movie. They're double-crossing each other and they, they're involved in the same plots and yeah. they, they are just continually one-upmanship with each other yeah. about the same things. The only difference is Clint Eastwood is Blondie. Yeah. That's it. I, I think the difference is that he doesn't, when he breaks his code, he doesn't do it in a violent manner. Right. So like Tuco, when he double crosses someone, he might shoot them. Angel Eyes very obviously kills everyone. When Blondie double crosses someone, it's sort of like, firstly, it's because they've like wound him up. Yeah. Like it's in response to a negative characteristic of the other person. Right. And also he doesn't kill them. He just like, you know, embarrasses them. Right, exactly. And so in that way, he's like that, you know, winking hero, anti-hero sort of. <laughs> kind actor. of, yeah. yeah. You see my point though? He's, no, totally, he's, yeah, he yeah. Is, he's, but th- that's what I think is good. And like last week when we were talking about True Grit, we mm-hmm. talked about the revisionist Western. Right. I think to some extent this film is the same no, absolutely, thing. absolutely, yeah. Because the, the fact that they're all called, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly belies the fact that they're actually all different shades of grey. Right. Maybe not Angel Eyes. He's pretty much evil. But but he's out for the same thing as the other two. Like right. They, they exactly. have the same goal in mind. Yeah. But they they yeah. But the film sets out. It's like calling your film like good 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 guys and bad guys. Right. And then showing that all of the good guys and all of the bad guys are within a spectrum yeah, yeah, of good and yeah. bad. Right. So it's exactly the same thing. Like they all have good and bad and ugly characteristics. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think in this film, there's a sense that they're reaching like the end of the Wild West. Yeah. I think especially in the sort of third act when there's more of a focus on the war. Exactly, yeah, yeah. um, It's all shown to be sort of futile Mm. and meaningless. Like it's all a bit, there's this enormous battleground where thousands and thousands of soldiers are set to die over this bridge. Which um, nobody really cares about. Yeah. No, because the second that it's been destroyed, it's no longer valuable. And so everyone They're, just moves on. Exactly, yeah. No one actually cares about... It's just like an arbitrary yeah. location. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because of that, it's it's all shown to be sort of quite pointless. Exactly. Um, and, and, and in that sense, I think it is re-examining, you know, the cowboy yeah. uh, war hero myths. 100%, yeah. I think there's... I mean... If you were to dress up as a cowboy, you'd go cowboy hat and a gun, right? right. That's, that's the core things you need. Yeah. And the guns in this, it starts out with them being like f- six shooters and they're doing like gunplay, mm. what you'd expect. And by the end, they're using these cannons and Gatling guns, which yeah. is just like destroying everyone. Hundreds of people are dying at a time. 
And it's just like, yeah, it goes from being like, oh, guns are cool to being war is hell. Yeah, it goes from it goes from there being like a sort of virtuosity yeah. in shooting people yeah. at the start because like our introduction to Blondie is literally him shooting his, his hip, hands off. Yeah. But not even like his hip yeah. and a gun on his hip and his hand, yeah. which he then like in a lightning fast re- reflex shoots three people before they can shoot him. Yeah. Like, so that's like, a, that starts out as like, um, look how cool he is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and obviously there's that whole like wild west code of like the hero can't shoot his gun before the other person right. draws and all that exactly, sort of thing. Yeah. But he's just better at it. Yeah. Which is why he kills them. Uh, to, as you say, like the, the senseless slaughter of thousands of people who are just exactly. being like churned through like a meat grinder. Exactly. And the, the other, the other thing that changes its tone slowly is when, um, like whiskey in the beginning, like uh, yeah. Tuco's character is drinking whiskey all the time, and yeah. he's like loves whiskey, and it's like, oh, he's a he's a good old boy from the wild west. Yeah. And when you meet the captain in in the the war camp, yeah, he's just drinking to numb the pain of right. war, right? To numb the pain of watching his men. Get, yeah, like, exactly. It's, fed it's just into this meat grind. It's just yeah. him coping, and it's yeah, it, and like it changes everything. And then Blondie gives him the whiskey at the end, and he's like, have a slug, and he's yeah. like he's doing that as like medicine because yeah. the man is so badly damaged by what was going on around him. Yeah. Which is like a huge tonal shift. Mm. It's almost like, you know, when bone Tomahawk changes from being like a, yeah. a, a, a cliche Western right. to being a weird, not, yeah, not a cliche. Horror movie. Yeah. Right. It's kind of like that. Yeah. But obviously a bit more sophisticated, mm-hmm. but you get like the sense of this is saying the world West is an illusion yeah. and cowboys and Indians would have got called up to die in a horrible war. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's one, in, one scene in particular uh, that I want to talk about and it won't be a surprise to anyone listening that it's the graveyard the bar scene. scene. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the graveyard scene. Yeah. Which I think uh, when it's within the context, I mean, even outside of its context, but especially when it's within the context um, of the three hour film, it is probably the most exciting scene and the most like tense and just satisfying. Like I, I'm not just thinking of <clears throat> the actual three way standoff. Right. I'm thinking of Tuco arriving at the gravestones and then the camera pans up and you see how many thousands of gravestones there yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. And the music comes in. He starts running between them. It gets, it, I always felt dizzy that part. Like, yeah. Really, well, there's a shot, which is watch. him sprinting through the gravestones. Yeah. And what they must have done is planted the camera on a really long lens yeah. in the middle and then have Spun him it. run around yeah. a circle because it feels like it's endless, yeah. right? As he's like running and running through all these gravestones. Yeah. Um, but it's it's majestic. It's, there's like no other word for it, I think. It's, it's, it's every element of cinema at its best married together right so you've got narr- like it's the narrative pinnacle of the film mm-hmm. it's soundtrack like that rushes in and carries so much emotion with it mm-hmm. the editing is fantastic the cinematography is- cinematography is fantastic the staging of the action when you consider that really there's only two meaningful shots that are fired within that whole 25 minute bit of the film yeah is incredible like the way it's staged and like the 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 way they position themselves within the environment the location itself mm. is incredible and the acting even though in a lot of these old films you know it's that very theatrical overacting thing yeah, yeah. i think the way in which um i mean i mentioned the editing a minute ago in the cinematography mm. The way in which the shots get tighter and tighter as they're stood in that sort of Mexican standoff. Yeah, it becomes claustrophobic, even though there's so much space. Yeah, but yeah. it's like it's it's all the shots that you recognise as like being Western cliches. Yeah. Like, you know, hip shot, man in distance, <laughs> yeah. like revolver on hip, yeah. hand, beady eyes, eyes, yeah. eyes switching from one person to another. Yeah. yeah. All of that. But it's come it's it's all of those tropes. But they're coming at the end of what has been an incredible journey. Yeah. And it's two hours and 45 minutes into a three hour film. Like, there's no other film that I can think of that injects its final scenes with so much meaning just through having it at the end of the film. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, mm. it comes at the end. It's, it's the equivalent of watching a, you know, 10 hour series 
and the you know the final scenes of the final episode have like all that meaning because you yeah. feel like you've come so far it's pretty um it, i think the best word for it as i said before is epic yeah but it, it's an epic payoff yeah i mean like it, we we were talking about true grit last week uh, last yeah. week mm-hmm. um if you consider that the the standoff in like i said in at the end the the climax of the action involves two shots and you think how much more dramatic and tense and meaningful that is than uh, Rooster on his horse firing two guns and there's four men firing back at him. Yeah. And like all the all the bullets that fly in that scene. Like two shots, two bullets are fired in the yeah. final scene. And it's it's incredible. And that scene, I think, is, you know, almost cinema as an art form at its pinnacle. And that's why I think that this film is like the film would be less the, the the scene watching it in isolation is lesser you know when it's taken out of its context right. and the film would be lesser if it didn't have that scene at the end of it and i think that's what makes it for me the best film that i've ever seen that final scene i think that scene basically seals the deal on that yeah 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 no i'd agree with it i think if it didn't have it it wouldn't be worth worth anywhere near as much in no. terms of interest no I, I don't disagree with you good well, good point and well made really that is a hell of a scene yeah I mean you, you go on a little little rant there mm. about how much you love it and I I, I agree with it yeah mentally. <laughs> little, little nitpick though right uh, how did Angel Eyes become a unionist sergeant like overnight was he not that already no he's Why a hitman yeah, but he's he's killing a Confederate soldier at the start, ex-Confederate soldier. I suppose so. It seems like he's just everything that the film needs him to be. I think he's he's more of a sort of like, you know, Navy SEAL or yeah. something. Yeah, but I agree that he's he is he's just a villain. He's a mercenary. He's, is what yeah, you mean. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, you've 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 written that part. <laughs> now it's back to a perfect film again. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's that time to move on to talking about how we would survive if we found ourselves in the spaghetti western environs mm. of uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Do you know why it's called spaghetti western? Uh, because it was shot predominantly in Italy. To save on costs. Yes. All the cast are Italian as well. Yeah, yeah. apart from Clint Eastwood. That's why it's dubbed. most of the... Uh, Main cast. Yeah. Yeah. But still, all the extras. Yeah. What about the half soldier? That was a weird thing. Right, the guy with no legs. Yeah, yeah. He, um, he calls him, hey, see you later, half soldier. It's like, that's so that's inappropriate. inappropriate. Yeah. It's a different time, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it is the villain saying that. Yeah, that's true. But yeah. I, 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 you can also imagine Clint Is Eastwood this a how to like, survive idea? No, is it's it just be a bit, nicer it's to a bit like, I mean, a bit, bit, bit SJW about the whole right. thing. Okay. Yeah. Left a sour taste, did it? You did, yeah, a little it bit. Ruined yeah. the film. Bit inappropriate. Hitting women and making fun of disabled yeah. people. I, I, I'm not an advocate for those bits of the film. No. You watch a uh, Sam Peckinpah film, you know, which is a director of the same era. Okay. Doing things like The Wild Bunch. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure that he would get, uh, you know, th- there's a scene, I think, in one of his films where a chicken is buried up to its head. Right. And then used as target practice and it's a real chicken right and i think similarly there's stuff with like horses being run off cliffs and things he did not give a fuck no um apparently not so sergio leone is is some you know measure above <laughs> that <guy. laughs> he's light years towards being a progressive social uh yeah. social thinker um and of course once he stopped making western films he went on to make straw dogs which is um a film with its own issues well, sergio leone made that <laughs> no um sam peckinpah right i was gonna say yeah yeah that's not good Apparently, there's a, 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 I've heard about a scene in a, in, a horror, a, in a Western movie, which I've never come across, but I've, I've heard about it, which is where a baby, a real baby, was put down um, on the floor. Right. And the idea was it would survive a stampede. And they actually drove horses over it, knowing that horses don't jump. If you get in a stampede with horses, apparently you're supposed to lie on the floor because they'll jump over you. Right. Buffalo will trample you, but okay. horses will jump over you. And they put this fucking baby in there and then drove the horses over it and filmed it. Fucking crazy shit. It's mad. Yeah. It was um, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Right. Is the, uh, is the chicken film in question. Look it up if you're p- feeling particularly anti animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Joe, how would you survive? If I was bayed up to my neck as a chicken? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Squawk, probably. Yeah, probably. Well, my first f- advice is for anyone in the film who isn't Blondie. <laughs> okay. And that's just torture Blondie. Right? Okay. So Blondie has the name for the grave, right? Okay. And as much as he says, like, yeah, you wouldn't get it out of me if you if you tortured me. So yeah. you fucking would. There's there are torture that methods of torture which work on people who think they're tough. Joe Shervel, advocate for torture. Well, I'm just saying that like, it would work. Like, if you, but I think I mean it depends on what level you're, uh, like you know, suggesting the advice really, doesn't it? If your name is the bad, I don't right. think it matters if you revert to torture. But I mean, like in the in the context of the film, right? It's posited that. Um, you know, the bad is obviously a person with experience of torture. Yeah. You would imagine that he knows who can and can't be tortured. Right. And right. he takes one look at Blondie and goes, you wouldn't have told me even if I'd tortured you, would you? And he goes, probably not. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. I Fine. mean, obviously he is going to say that. It's bravado. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, in Game of Thrones, you know, House Bolton. Right. Well, their sigil is the flayed man. Yeah. And they, one of the mottos of their house is... A naked man has few secrets. Right. A flayed man has none. Yeah. Now I'm saying... Flay, if, what you're saying is you're advocating the flaying of people. Yeah. Flay Clint Eastwood. Right. And you'll find out exactly the name you need. Yeah. And more, Maybe. probably. It strikes me that um, Blondie is a man to bear a grudge, though. Like, so... If you, you flay can, someone, they're not going to come back But, like, that. as in, I can imagine that he wouldn't tell you just out of spite. I think you could... Probably, I mean, if I said to you, oh, please tell this me. This is getting a bit distasteful, isn't it? But I'm saying <laughs> like, if you really wanted to know. Right. Like, okay, the, so your advice is for... Um, what's the... For Angel, Angel, Eyes. Angel Eyes would not give a fuck. Right. Uh, he, he beats people up all the time. He does not... He's a psychopath. Yeah. Right? Now, what's his... Is he suddenly learn a moral code and be like, no, I'm not going to hurt you because you're... It's not a moral thing. Cool. It's a... It's a um, yeah. Pragmatist but thing. He hasn't even tried. No. Like but he doesn't. I, anyone he, with any logic knows that if you talk to someone, they will tell you what you want to know eventually. Right. right? Okay. Yeah. They might lie to you. It's, it, it, you know, in, in another thing, it's like if you talk to someone, they'll tell you anything. Mm. Right. They'll tell you this, they started the Great Fire of yeah. London. Right. But I, I guarantee you, if you keep going, they'll tell you. Right. right. I know I sound like a lunatic. Yeah. Yeah. An advocate for torture. Yeah. Vegan Joe Shervel <laughs> is an advocate for the torture of other human beings. Only in the context of wanting to find out where the gold is buried. Great. Um, would that not work? I've got another less it, distasteful. Would, would, it, would it not work? I don't know. Would it work? Uh, well, I don't know. Torture is is. Um, I mean, if we're talking seriously, yeah. torture is often uh, decried as ineffective because people just make up any old shit and tell you that um, uh, yeah. tell you that they you know they're the Queen of England, right? Which is why torture is you know confessions that are under under torture yeah, yeah. are inadmissible, inadmissible yeah. in any like progress you know progressive yeah. society if, if in you the coerce world. a confession out of someone i agree but you, you're not i mean what you could do then is torture blondie till he gives you a name mm. go check that name and if it's not true keep torturing him till he gives you the right name right lovely guy but if you if it takes to the point where you've flayed him for him to give you a fake name, mm. he's not going to be alive when you return, is he? Listen, <laughs> you've all got right, to flay McGarvey, all his skin off. Hell. I'm just saying, Jesus. There's right. Let's move on. Let's move do you, on. Do you I'm disagree? Not that. He, I'm not, like, to, he, he tortured one man and it worked. You would he, not, in any context other than this, advocate torture. No, I wouldn't. Yeah. So why are you advocating it now? Because you know it doesn't work. Because I think it would work. I think all you need is a name out of him. And he's not, like, he's not, like, he's a pragmatist, he's a pragmatist, right? Right. If you said, I'm going to cut you, cut your skin off your leg. Yeah. If you don't tell me the name, he'd go, well, fucking tell you the name. I don't care that much. Right. What I think is that you're going to listen back to this and be quite upset with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Right. Uh... I mean, far away from torture, Joe. Yeah. I want to talk about executing people. <laughs> Without capital trial. punishment, <laughs> yeah. Right, but my issue is not necessarily with the um, the lack. It's more the, the no. It's, <laughs> it's not. It's not. Um, it's not whether or not they should be doing it. It's how they should be doing <laughs> it. Right. The administering, uh, the administration of capital punishment. Okay. okay yeah, yeah. Um, my suggestion is don't execute people uh, on the perfect means of escape. <laughs> 
Because all right. the people that we see yeah. hung, hanged, hanged, yeah. um, are on horseback, right. and the idea being that you um, slap the horse, slap the horse, it moves, and they fall onto the noose, right, yeah. and are hanged. Yeah. Now, what ends up happening repeatedly <laughs> is that Blondie shoots the rope. Yep. And uh, Tuco or whoever it is lands on the horseback mm-hmm. and then rides off to safety because the horse is startled by the gunshot. Yeah. So it's the perfect means of escape, right? Like you wouldn't execute people in a car with the keys <laughs> and the ignition no. just in case something went wrong and they were able to escape. <laughs> right. you'd, just, you'd execute them in a specially made environment. But you wouldn't execute anyone, presumably. No, I wouldn't do it. Like, like, just in, like I wouldn't torture anyone. Right, exactly. But the... like. Just use a box. Yeah, kick it out. They can't escape the town on a box. Well, there is a scene where they kind of, I think, just to, to prove that wrong, mm-hmm. uh, the horse runs away and there's a moment where you think Tuco may actually be hanged. Right. Blondie shoots the rope and he runs away on foot and the, he Blondie distracts the sheriff and the, the judge and the executioner by shooting their hats off and rendering them just so speechless, so so shocked that they can't even move. Yeah, and then they run away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but my point is that none of that would have happened if it was just like a chair. Yeah, or they just yeah, mm. or shoot him. It's a poor. It's a like it's not like if you use a chair or a box to hang someone, then you can never use that again. No, so just. Do that. Have a have a gallows. I've never seen that before when they yeah. use a horse. Weird. It is weird. It seems. I wonder if Blondie's going and going. I'll give you this prisoner on the condition that you'll execute him sat <laughs> on a horse. Yeah. Why? Don't know. It's just I like knowing that that's going to happen. Are you going to stick around for the execution? No. Uh, well, I like watching it from don't, distance. Yeah, don't Forty worry. yards or so. Don't yeah. worry about that. Um, yeah. There you go. Don't execute people on horseback. <laughs> yeah, I can't argue with it. There you go. There's a reason they don't do it now, I imagine. Well, many reasons they don't yeah. do it now. It's illegal. Yeah. Um, if if in the gas Joe chambers of advocating Texas, advocating torture and capital punishment, yep. execution. Lovely guy. How to survive show at gmail.com for your complaints, Joe. Any further thoughts? My next point is about gun control. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not really. Uh, it's more. If you run a gun shop... Yeah, I've got exactly the same. (laughs) (laughs) Don't hand out ammunition for your guns in your gun shop to obviously drunk patrons. Yeah. Yeah. Who you've never met. That is a recipe for disaster, isn't it? (laughs) In the Wild West as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's... I mean, do you want to talk about the scene? It's basically Tuco... um, Walks into a gun shop. Yeah. And the gun store owner is like, he basically tries loads of pistols that don't work. Yeah. And he, the, the the store owner says, oh, this is my best pistol. Well, what he does is he takes the cartridge out of another pistol and puts it in. So he's building his own custom right. pistol. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the shopkeeper, and then he's like, oh, I want to try this gun yeah, out. Give me the gun. The bullets, yeah. 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 So he gives him bullets and then he's like, well, now I've got a load of guns. So I'm obviously just going to rob you. Yeah. Which is what he does. Don't do that. Yeah. You're a gun owner. You're a gun shop owner. <laughs> yeah. And it's the Wild West. Yeah. So, like, it, I mean, I feel like in GTA 4, I think you can rob gun shops. <laughs> right. But the problem is, as soon as you pull a gun on them, they immediately, like, next second have a gun in their hand and they're shooting right. you. Yeah, yeah. You'd think the gun shop owner would be that smart about guns. Yeah. Like he'd have a pistol loaded in his pocket just to draw. Yeah. Like, or under the table, yeah. or when he goes, can I shoot it? Can yeah. I try it out? You go, no, obviously not. That's yeah. mental. Yeah. You wouldn't do that now. If you went to America and you bought a gun in a gun shop, mm. or a Walmart, or yeah, wherever yeah, they yeah. fucking sell them, petrol stations, <laughs> yeah. right? I presume they don't let you, like, wander around the aisles with a loaded gun. Yeah. Then again, it's America, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, nice. But I mean, it, we watched um, Free Fire a little while ago. Yeah. And there's a scene in that where there's a, a gun trade is happening. Mm. And... Uh, Army, Army Hammer's character yeah. pulls a gun out and says, while there's loaded weapons, I'm going to draw my gun as insurance against the craziness right. that could happen. Right? Yeah. That's what you should be doing. Yeah. He, said, he, I, should I, be, he should have a gun to hand yeah. for security, which you would imagine he would have. Yeah. He's got enough of them around. Exactly. He could literally pick up any anything in his <laughs> shop and it would be lethal. 
Yeah. Like he's very lucky that Tuco isn't in a worse mood. Yeah. Or like just or feeling he, cruel or, or that it wasn't angelized. a worse person that yeah. did it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on a similar note, my final bit of advice is um, to learn to differentiate uh, whether your gun is loaded or not. Right, okay. Because Tuco, obviously, in the Mexican standoff, discovers that his gun had been unloaded the previous <laughs> night by Blondie. Yeah. Now, I've seen that trope before, for example, in Die Hard, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, where Hans Gruber is given a gun and then he finds it's not loaded and mm. it's like, oh, I thought it felt a little light, mm. right? Tuco doesn't have that excuse because the cartridge of his gun is exposed and he <laughs> should see that there are no bullets in it, yeah. right? So quite apart from the fact that it's lighter, he should know that his gun is unloaded and right. go, well, I mean, if we're going to have a Mexican standoff, can I at least have some bullets? Yeah. It, what would you think happen in that situation? Because if he said, I'm just going to check the... Guys, I haven't got any bullets. Yeah. Can you chuck me some? Well, I... I don't know. Like, or would how, he be excused? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I mean, would someone lend him one? Lend him a bullet? Yeah, maybe. Oh, because that, that's a chance for Angel Eyes to say, I'll give you a bullet, but only if you shoot Blondie. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Yeah. No, it's, it's not. It's not I wouldn't yeah. trust Tuco to uh, keep up his end of the bargain. Though. Do you think that if you, if you checked, your, checked your gun, you'd like pick up your gun. Now, you, now you've got a loaded gun in your hand, as far as yeah. I can say, I think your head blown off. Well, they've all got loaded guns, haven't they? But I think as soon as you... On their person. As soon as you pick it up, that's it, isn't it? Possibly, yeah. Mm. Mm. It really didn't turn out too bad with Tuka. He survives and gets yeah. quite rich. How about you? Any final thoughts? Yeah, last idea mm. is if you are a um, vulnerable person mm. who's in charge of an army yeah, and you think you um, there's someone who might usurp your position and use it for evil, mm. don't say... As long as I'm commandant, things are going to the things are going to run properly around here. Yeah, when you're on your deathbed and yeah. someone could easily just smother you or mm-hmm. just like, stop feeling otherwise you. kill you. Yeah. yeah, like someone who you're more or less reliant on to survive. Sure, don't say to them, "As long as I'm alive, I'm going to make life hard for you." Mm. That's the advice for the commandant. Yeah, you're not in a position of power in that um, negotiation. Are no, you? exactly. Yeah. yeah. If if you if I was starving to death upstairs and you were the one delivering my food and I was like, as long as we're in my house, Chris, as long as I'm alive, <laughs> you're gonna be. I'm gonna really make life hard for you. Yeah. What would you do? Stop well, feeding me. Yeah. Exactly. Because you're a psychopath. Yeah. Exactly. And you've I already, advocate you, torture. Yeah. And you've you've already flayed me and tried to hang me <laughs> at this point. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you just tell me where the gold is, buried, yeah. then we'd have no issues. Yeah. So that's my advice for him: is just don't like yeah. use some common sense and say. I don't He's have got a reputation about- as well. Yeah. Like, you should know better. Yeah. You, you're, you're admonishing him for basically killing and torturing people. Yeah. Don't say, don't kill and torture people <laughs> like me who are victims. Who is yeah, vulnerable in front of you. Prize. Prime. Prime for torture and murder. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, maybe if he's a mercenary, then the army would turn on him. Yeah, maybe. But then he gets helped out in torturing and everything, doesn't he? So maybe he's paying them. Who knows? It's not in the film. No. But there was plenty in the film. Yeah. And it's all been discussed. It's been put to bed. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Don't forget to leave a five-star review if you've enjoyed the podcast. And I hope you have. You know, if you haven't enjoyed the podcast, maybe you could let us know um, what we could do better on. Uh, We're always looking to improve. Um, fuck and, off at how to survive show. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and obviously if we don't like your email then we'll just delete it so win win how to survive show at gmail.com you can also uh, send us abuse at how to survive pod or facebook.com forward slash how to survive pod yeah and we're looking out for suggestions for films we should cover in the future yeah we like doing listener suggestions because yeah. we always get a little bit of uh, feedback yeah. and uh, obviously if you have uh, listened to the back catalogue of uh, of our podcast. I I think what a lot of people tend to do is discover our podcast and then look back through our back catalogue and, uh, you know, listen back to all the ones that they missed, which uh, maybe their favourite films or films they've seen. Mm. Don't um, forget that you can email at any time. And and say, how how would you survive in that movie? Yeah, exactly. And we will go back and and cover that. Yeah. Coming up soon, we've got, um, we we did Die Hard last year. They're going to do Die Hard 2 this year. Die Harder. Yeah. So yeah. how would you survive Die Hard? Because we will uh, Die Harder. That's the time to talk about it. Yeah. It's a little way off yet, because yeah. next week we've got... Uh, the big one. Yeah, a little little movie. Uh, it's an independent production, I think. Yeah. Um, Tiny. Yeah. You may have heard of it. Star Wars Episode Eight: The mm. Last Jedis. Yeah. Yeah. Jedi, mate. It's plural. Oh. Good. Looking forward to it? Yeah. 
Not well, as much as I was Force Awakens. No, but then Rogue One was in between those yeah. uh, two, wasn't it? And we didn't enjoy Rogue One. Yeah, exactly. If if like if you consider like, um, on the set of a porn film, right? They often say there's like a, a fluffer. Have you heard about this? Right. It's like someone who gets everyone excited, ready to go. Right? Yeah. What's the opposite of that? It'll be like someone who has like a sandpaper machine <laughs> going around. It's like. Yeah, yeah. That's that is what Rogue One was to my excitement over Star Wars. Right. What a troubling metaphor that was. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe cut that out. Maybe cut that out. That's I'm not going to cut that terrible. out. Nor am I going to cut out your asking for it to be cut out. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time. Yes, Sano.